Let's good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know a couple of people who said they were going to come may saunter in, but we're going to go ahead and move forward. Uh, can everyone hear me? So it's more importantly, I want to make sure you can hear him when he comes up. Um, um, I, I'm really thrilled to be here at the Social Justice um, in Education Award Lecture and to be able to um, speak for many people um, who have who sent uh, many, many thoughts, um, information perspectives that really led to kind of what's happening here tonight. So the Social Justice uh, in Education Award is awarded by the Social Justice uh, Action Committee uh, to honor a scholar who has made outstanding contributions across their career through their research and scholarship to causes of social justice um, in a, societally, um, nationally, internationally, um, and I can say that our honoree tonight, uh, Dr. James Moore III, um, is such a deserving honoree. Um, my biggest challenge tonight was actually to try to develop a version of his bio that did not take the whole lecture time. Um, that is how much um, our committee um, um, had to work with in terms of both the description of just the things that he hasn't been involved in, as well as the testaments to the, the importance and the impacts of this work. And so I'm going to just give you a snapshot, and hopefully, as you'll see in a few moments, um, that uh, James himself will uh, remind or um, demonstrate the, the reason that he is our honoree for tonight. So uh, Dr. James Moore the uh, third is an ARE member and holds many, many titles. So that's starting with one. Just reading his titles alone will take a while. Um, um, at the Ohio State University. Um, before I start, I, I always forget to introduce myself. And so I'll do that because my, uh, I am the chair of the Social Justice Action Committee. Um, another member, um, James Earl Davis, is here too. I um, want to thank my committee. But I am a faculty member, a professor of education and psychology at the University of Michigan. So that tells you how great James is, because despite the hatred that Michigan and Ohio State have for each other, that there was like a no-brainer when it came to the discussion um, about his accomplishments and his deservingness of this award. He is currently the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at The Ohio State University. And he is uh, the Distinguished Professor, the Education and Human Ecology Distinguished Professor of Urban Education. And he is the Executive Director of the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male, which is one of the first centers of its kind to focus on research and practice around the, educate, the positive educational development and support for African American boys and men in the context of education, but also in the context that affect black males um, and their opportunities for achievement. Because of his excellence in all of these roles, uh, he was viewed as an ideal nominee and, and honoree for the Social Justice and Education Award. He consistently and expertly links his research to the implementation of social justice initiatives and programs. Um, just to give you a snapshot, that he's had an engaging research career, but I'll also describe how some of the ways in which his research has engaged practice and policies and the idea of a scholar who is intellectually curious and rigorous in his work and does work that has practical and theoretical importance and applications is exactly the kind of scholar that we're looking to honor in this space. Since his early years as an assistant professor, he's been committed to the social and educational advancement of African American students um, more broadly, and in particular the experiences um, and, the, and the pathways of African American males at every juncture of their formal learning. So he's had the kind of unique profile of working broadly but deeply in the elementary, secondary, and post-secondary levels, contributing work in all of those spaces and contributing knowledge about the experiences of students. His scholarship has focused primarily on identifying challenges and developing strategies for removing educational barriers, including but not limited to recruitment and retention issues for students of color in gifted education and other advanced accelerated learning programs, external factors that enhance and impede academic progress for students, particularly African-American males, 
and the socialization of educational professionals and their influences on student experiences and outcomes. With over 100 publications, more than that actually, and 200 presentations across the world, he's a scholar activist. Dr. Moore's work positively impacts the lives of African American male children, adolescents, and college age students. According to a, a, a recent uh, online version of the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. He's one of nine African-American distinguished professors in education across the country. Uh, it's also important to note that along with his national impact, that his influence uh, spans glo more globally. Social scientists and education practitioners in numerous countries have valued, called upon, and applied his work as evidenced by his engagements in Canada, Brazil, the United Kingdom, France, Indonesia, China, and other nations, just to name some. Uh, the North Central Association for Counselor Education and Supervision, Ohio School Association, American College Personnel Association Standing Committee on Men and Masculinities, the American Educational Research Association in many of its spaces um, and, organ and, and organizational committees, the National Alliance of Black School Educators, the National Association for Gifted Children, the American Counseling Association, and the National Association for Multicultural Education are just some of the professional societies, not even all, that have formally recognized Dr. Moore's research achievements focused on African American males. In the context of applying research to policy and practice, as the inaugural di executive director of the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male, Dr. Moore has secured grant and contract funding in excess of a million dollars to support its mission. Uh, throughout, he, he, through, that, through the Bell Center, uh, he founded the National African American Male Retreat for undergraduate students, which attracts over 100 African American male students across the United States. He also co-founded the International Colloquium for Black Males in Education, an annual meeting focused on black males throughout the globe, which attracts social and behavioral scientists, education researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and students. His work on African American males has been acknowledged by other important policy groups in addition to professional scholarly societies, such as the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Association for Public and Land Grant Universities, the College Board, Education Trust, and American College Personnel Association. It has been cited in many, many journals and publications, as well as in policy practice reports, as well as popular media, which we know that all types of public engagement are important for scholarly dissemination. Dr. Moore has been described as a servant leader in all the communities that he w in which he identifies. Uh, his agenda related to African American males, his work to both to produce knowledge that is used by other scholars, but his also work to be a part of the dissemination. I think this is really important for education scholars now, thinking about our uh, conference theme around truth and education research, that more and more we cannot be satisfied with scholars producing the research that others use, that we must be a part of the dissemination in order to help ensure that rigorous research helps inform important social and educational decisions that are being made, um, that we'll have the best chance of it being informed by research and evidence if we also are a part of that. And finally, um, I will just highlight, in addition to scholarly impact, bringing together other scholars, so leveraging the strengths and the synergies of other scholars and the application to research and practice, Dr. Moore has been an exemplary mentor to countless mentees uh, spanning the K through 20 educational system from elementary to secondary to higher education and into faculty in the tenure track and the policy and practice workforce. Um, as you can see, just by this snapshot, that he truly exemplifies the spirit of this award, and our committee just really was came to easy consensus that uh, there was no one uh, as deserving, or that there could be not a profile that is more deserving. Um, and we uh, just want to honor you tonight, uh, and I'm honored to speak for the committee and for AERA to congratulate you and to recognize the important work that you've done and will continue to do. Thank you. And with that, I want to bring on board the main speaker. As you can see, that was just a little bit. Um, Dr. Moore, thank you. And without further ado, Dr. Moore. Wow. Huh. 
Well, thank you for this opportunity, first and foremost. I don't take this lightly. Uh, I remember nearly 20 years ago, next year will be 20 years, when I first came to AERA. And I'm just as nervous as I was when I came nearly 20 years ago. Uh, I w first of all, I want to just thank all the many people who gave me an opportunity to be able to do the work that I do. And I personally would do the work for free uh, if my wife would have let me. Um, and so I want to acknowledge my wife. She lets me do this work. Um, and I have four kids, and my wife is equally as committed as I am to this work. And so uh, I want to just really acknowledge and give her some kudos. Um, equally as important, I just really want to thank my mother. I wish she was here living to hear those words because um, she was the first to say that a lot was possible for her son. And so um, I want to thank all my colleagues that I work with that are here. Um, but I also want to thank, more importantly, uh, Dr. James Davis because he provided a roadmap for up and coming scholars like myself. And much of what I'm going to talk about, Dr. Davis is a Morehouse man. Uh, we hijacked everything from Morehouse uh, to kind of create uh, a success model for young men around the country. When I first started doing this work many years ago, it felt like I was in a room by myself. And the words that, as soon as I expressed the plight, the challenges, as well as the opportunities for black males. It felt like it was coming, I was talking to myself. And, you know, when Dr. Davis first did the work, he was one of the pioneers. He's a very humble soul. Is that he was, him and a few other colleagues, they were like some of the first to do the first wave of work. And I think they did some commission papers from the U.S. Department of Education at that time. And then in my mind, uh, being an educator, a K-12 teacher, I said, this cannot be possibly true. There are some people achieving in spite of. And I was like, well, very little was captured in that. And um, so I began to develop a, a quest to do work around that because I got the experience at the local level in Lyman, South Carolina how we all started together, but as we continue to progress through the pipeline, so many of us didn't get to the end. So these issues are uh, what I like to say, uh, K to gray kinds of issues. And I'm gonna try to my, my best to kind of uh, do justice. I struggle with what do I wanna talk about when you got so many studies. And then I, somebody told me, you don't just talk about a study when you get to this juncture. So I'm still learning. I'm still a learner. So um, so you all are my test bed with this. Uh, my talk is embracing K-12 advanced academics and post-secondary matriculation. And when I say advanced academics, uh, if my colleague Donna Ford was here tonight, she would say we're still trying to desegregate uh, advanced placement in America and some of our gifted programs. Uh, you can go on, and I'm going to highlight some of those things. And even when the students get to college, even when their families have the means, it still is an uphill battle. And that's what I'm going to kind of highlight today. How many know that life on the margins is an unpleasant reality for so many young men in America? And there's a stigma of inferiority that follow uh, black males everywhere they go. Um, unfortunately, uh, they're seen as a part of a group rather than the individual. And so it doesn't matter where your mother or father, what they do for a living or where they live, they're oftentimes seen as a part of that group. In America, I want you to say uh, most of us have seen these images in some form. and. When you look at the national data, going back to the 50s, when we used to keep matriculation data, black women were the only group, when you compare all the other women, that they matriculated, they matriculated at a higher rate for a long period of time, for nearly 100 years. Um, 
and white women pass white men in the 80s. Now, if you come to Ohio State, there's not a tremendous gap between um, those who are enrolled and between women and men, uh, generally speaking. But you can go to some of our top flagship and public universities. Increasingly, you see more women than men in college. Now, the reality of it is, is that I predict in the next 15 to 20 years, there will be a new wave of affirmative action. And that new wave will probably be men. And I'm going to highlight some of these kinds of things. In 2004, I think, when the Newsweek, the boys' crisis, people began to highlight that the underachievement and low achievement of white males in America. And you read, I went to a think tank, a conservative think tank, and I was, I can't, I was invited to present my research on black males, and we brought a gentleman who did work on uh, the Latinx males, and we had Dr. Charles Murray there. So Dr. Murray was like the boogeyman when I was in school because he wrote The Bell Curve and some of the uh, ideas that he presented in that book. And at that time, his new book came out, and he began to describe, if you didn't know the race of the group, many of us might have thought stereotypically that he was talking about black and Latino males. And so many of the kinds of um, sociological dilemmas that we often associate with black males and Latin males, in his work, he began to realize that many working class, working poor, white males were exhibiting some of those same things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I want you to be aware of these things, and I'm going to show you some data as a snapshot. But also, this issue around uh, underachievement and low achievement for black males is not just a USA thing. You can go in Canada. We came to Canada, what, two years ago in the city. You see the same dilemma among <coughs> black males. So, their history is not quite the same as black Americans. But you can go even in the UK, and the UK is already exploring affirmative action for males in ways that we're not paying attention. And in China, you can do a Google in China, and you can quickly recognize that China is worried about the young Chinese lad because he increasingly the Chinese male in China is low, low achieving and underachieving in compared to his counterpart. So these are images, popular images that people are talking about. But one thing we know that I, I've learned, and I'll highlight some of these things, you can give women a tenth of what you give men, and the gap will be even higher, larger, in many ways. But I want you to see this within the group, and this is just a snapshot of, of previous years, that you can see women comparison within groups and you see the between groups these are consistent trends across america and how many here have noticed these trends in at your own institutions now i'm not suggesting that women i don't want nobody to walk out of here and say i'm suggest because i got three daughters and i have a wife that run that slaps me around metaphorically often um you're supposed to laugh at that, right? <laughs> but but, but there, even though women are matriculating at a higher rate, but when we look at employment outcomes, they're vastly different in terms of salaries and pay. And that's a whole nother issue, but I don't only have so much time. I want to highlight some of these contextual factors that is quite important when we think about life career development life academic development. And the first thing is interest. Now, there's a whole body of knowledge around interest. How do we get young men interested in learning and academics? And there's a whole body of knowledge which many eminent professors at this meeting have did a lot of work. But where the big gap when we start talking about interest is how do we sustain young people's interests? See, for something they say at the early elementary years, 
that many of the young boys are just as eager and excited for learning. But as they continue to progress, they become disengaged, disinterested in the schools. Now, I'm not going to blame just totally white teachers because you can go in some of the urban schools where the teachers look just like them and they equally look, you see the same patterns. So interest is an important thing when we think about learning and education. I know we have several major funding agencies from the government, but more needs to be explored around how do we sustain this interest for young people. And um, the next one is preparation. And this preparation is an issue that we see throughout the educational continuum. All AP is not created equally. We see educational malpractice take place at a high level consistently across America. And even when you look in communities where it's very affluent. What people don't often know when we talk about gaps, not that I like to talk about educational gaps, but that's all, but I, I'm gonna use that as a part of my um, narrative here, is that th the achievement gap is greater for the $100,000 black family versus the $100,000 white family. The gap is not as wide on the low end of the continuum. So that suggests it's not just class, like everybody's comfortable in America to just say it's class. It's the intersectionality of race, class, gender, in some cases, geographical location. So preparation is critical, and so many of our young men have not been afforded. They take an AP class, and they realize when they go to college that it wasn't quite the same class that some of their peers. In my mind, that's educational malpractice at the highest level. So preparation is, is very important. And I also want to back up about preparations is that when you don't have the preparation, you're not afforded opportunities in which you can achieve your educational aspirations. The other one is experience. How do we ensure that these young men throughout the continuum have specific experiences that are indicative of the kind of aspirations that they have or the educational trajectory that they may pursue. So too many, when you're not, when you don't have the right classes, when you don't have the right teachers, it has rippling effects on the outcomes of many of our young people. Connections, unfortunately, when you look at K-12 contexts, many people think the young men just need a mentor. But I'm going to highlight some important things in some of my work about those connections. Connections give people the ability to see and experience things before they even actually experience it, because you have someone who serves as a, as a, as a as a guide, as a bridge. Opportunity. You can't even access your opportunities if you don't have the preparation and experiences. And so at Ohio State, people say, I sent stuff to the young men, but they didn't respond. Or sometimes they don't respond because they automatically foreclose on the opportunity because you say you need these certain criteria and they don't even try. So these are some trends that we are seeing in the body of knowledge that increasingly people are doing uh, more examining differences in women and men, uh, academic achievement. And you see just a proliferation of the literature right now. And even some agencies may say, well, we, gotta, we know enough about men, but sometimes the minority males we don't know as much as we should know about this specific group. National data show that there's distinct differences between males and females in the number of students enrolled in STEM majors. Now granted in engineering, we see that it's certainly 
a overwhelming number of males, but in some of the STEM areas, um, you see vast differences. African Americans are underrepresented, underrepresented in gifted programs, and they typically are overrepresented in special education. The Schott Foundation did a report maybe like five years ago and suggested that over 100,000 black males uh, were misdiagnosed and misplaced in special education. Now, what's the problem? See, I'm a counselor by training. If you know anything about this guy named Clifford Beers, and he wanted to study in the early 1900s, why mental health, psychiatric hospitals, we just did it bad. So he wanted to do a study. He pretended that he was crazy, that he had a mental disorder. I shouldn't say that. Excuse that. Not crazy. But he had a mental disorder. And what he discovered in his work even when you don't have a mental disorder, if you stay around the people with a mental disorder long enough, you start to act as if you have a mental disorder. So if you put somebody in a program that they don't supposed to be in, they'll start to exhibit when you are testing them for gifted and talented programs that you might say, this is not a good fit for them. So other trends that we see, we see women surpass men in bachelor degree completion for the first time in the mid-1980s, and white women are not looking behind. They just further uh, leaving white males behind. But when you look, as I said, across, when you look at women across race, black women are the only ones who said, we've been kicking the black males' butt for a long time. And they're not slowing up at all. To the point we're so desperate in higher education across America, because I have run a lot of programs, we always ask, do we have male representation? And some slots could be almost taken up entirely by women. And there's a whole number of issues that I'll highlight before it's over with. Kind of hit this. You see a larger portion, portion of white men completed college than women from 1940 to the 1980s, and less than 1% of black men earned a degree in 1940, compared to 2% women. So long standing. But we know teachers play a critical role. And so before I talk about this, it's not in here, but this is just a stimulus. I'm, you can see I'm trying to get warmed up here, is that I did a study in 2003, it's in the High School Journal, and we wanted to look at educational aspirations of urban learners urban senior high school students. And we wanted to see what variables impact their educational aspirations. Locus of control, cognitive ability, because we wanted to first want to control, do they have the ability to be successful? We looked at income, because everybody said, why well, you don't do well, it's because you're poor, right? Then the next thing we looked at, students' perceptions, how the teacher perceive them, students' perceptions, how the school counselors perceive them. The perceptions impacted the students more than the other variables. In other words, if I perceive you perceiving me not having the ability, it had negative effects on my aspirations. For other groups, that's not always the case when you think about Asian students and white students. The effects tend to be more profound for those groups when we're referencing parents. So, going back to teachers, teachers communicate often, whether they're conscious of it or not. Sometimes that students don't have the ability to be successful. So here's a study I want to highlight that kind of connects closely to the study we did in 2003 using the nails and NAS ALs, they dropped the N, was 2002, we used the 1999 data set. A recent study examined the systematic biases of teachers' expectations related to demographic match between a teacher and a student. The demographic match mean the teacher is black, the student is black. A mitch match, the student is, the teacher is white, and the student is black. The data set included two teachers reported expectations of each student's ultimate educational attainment. And that's, as I said, one demographic. The researchers discovered that non-black teachers of black students had significantly 
lower expectations than black teachers. And the effects were even larger for black males and math teachers. So this is, it has nothing to do with what they actually did. It's just really based on how they perceive them, which is powerful and is something that we can work on. I do a lot of work in gifted ed, which is important, and a lot of the federal funding agencies don't quite spend a lot of time with gifted and talented students. And I know it has a long history and some people want to reject it. Now, some scholars interchangeably use gifted and high achieving when they're not the same. To be gifted, there's a set of criteria that each state outlines for how to meet that criteria. To be a gifted student is to interest and you can grossly underachieve and have the gifted tag, we still call you gifted. In the United States, we don't have a mechanism to take the tag off of you once you get it. What we find, what people don't understand, the biggest underachievers and low achievers are gifted students. But we always don't recognize those things because the, stem, the curriculum does not always match their capability. So as you can see, this is when we did a study, this is a part of a commission paper that Council of Great City Schools asked us to do. And these are some of the, I pulled some of the tables out of that publication. As you can see, when you're low income, you're probably less likely to be in gifted and talented programs. Now in that commission paper, we highlighted some of the things that prevent students from going into gifted and talented programs. And these are some of the examples of some of the criteria that schools use. If you miss a day of school, you can't be in a gifted and talented program. If your parents don't come to these PTA meetings, your child can't be in a gifted and talented program. If your parents don't pay the application fee to, to, to submit the paper, they can't be in a gifted. You will be blown away of the policies that we have across the nation that basically inhibits from students from being able to participate in advanced placement or gifted programs. Now, I like to use this as an example oftentimes, hopefully I know they're videotaping this, but I hope my wife doesn't see it. My wife finally had a greater appreciation for my work because she thought I was just writing book reports. And that's what she reduced my work to. But I didn't try to correct her. Because like I said, my wife metaphorically slaps me around. But nevertheless, she became more immersed in this work when they started to mess with her son. He, got, he has my son, but he's not my son. It's her son, right? And when you mess with somebody's, a mom's son, you're going to have to deal with all types of issues she's doing but nevertheless she then took an interest in my work and reading the book so this is what you've been talking about right because people didn't know who his parents were because he was seen as a part of a group rather than an individual so I was Dennis the Menace when I was a child but I also love Curious George because it's my favorite book series but the words that you use, the behaviors were similar. But we use different words to describe those behaviors. In gifted and talented programs, we think that's part of overexcitability, uh, engagement, excitement for enthusiasm. It's a part of what it, you see in a gifted and talented program. But in some classes, we see it suppressed for young men when they raise their hand, when they engage. In this country, fundamentally, we need to radically change education for young men, broadly speaking. And I say this because I, when I go to all of these countries, I always want to see how they do education. And one place, in ex one example in particular is when I went to Indonesia. 
and I ne it left a, a, a stunning, lasting impact on me. The school, the classes are quiet. The students are focused. They're writing notes. I mean, they doing what writing their notes. They focus on the instruction. But when the kids get out, this is an elementary school. When they leave the classroom to take their break, the boys over there tackling someone. They over there wrestling, and I'm walking. Teachers just walk right by them, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, like in America, if a kid gets out of line. A little bit. You, 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 the teacher loses his or her mind. Not recognizing that how do you create structure and still create meaning in the learning as well. But anyway, as you can see, uh, when you're low income, you're less likely to be in a gifted and talented program if you're African American male. And as you can see, if you live in a rural area, you're less likely in compared to all the other social contexts. But this is something that we found that was quite telling, and I know I don't have a lot of time to spend on this because I want to highlight some things that you can do in what our research and what we've been doing at, at the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on African American Male. Even when school districts have a, a critical mass of black students, Black males are grossly underrepresented in gifted and talented programs. When you look at some of our 20 largest school districts in America, they're grossly underrepresented, even when they're in an the urban school district. And that's what we discovered uh, in that commission um, study that we did. And you probably see some of it. I'll let you look. I'm not going to spend it because I need, I only have so much time. So you can see some of these school districts. You know, the one that stands out, which is a model school district to some degree, is Montgomery County. And usually, most of the time, when you look at College Board's report, they typically highlight Montgomery County public schools, not Prince George County schools, but Montgomery. And as you can see, the numbers are pretty high. So there are test beds that we can evaluate and have better understanding. What is it that Montgomery County is doing, county public schools are doing, that Fairfax, where my kids go to school, that are not doing it? Now, when you go in Fairfax, it's anecdotal, but I would imagine from the places, the little data I've seen, you know, increasingly in the D.C. area, I'll use that as an example, the students may have black on their birth certificate, but oftentimes they're first generation Americans, right? And But they don't identify as African American, but their birth certificate says the same thing as mine says. It doesn't say Ethiopian or Nigerian, uh, you know, and those kinds of things. There are a number, of, these are some of the many factors, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Inappropriate early curricular experiences, absence of opportunities to develop appropriate work habits. And so when the students are not in the class, we know there's a school to prison pipeline. We see when you go into, I had a contract as an example of this. I had a contract when Governor Strickland was the governor in Ohio. And it was an achievement gap initiative. The state put $20 million to kind of improve uh, educational outcomes for black males in the state. And they found that black males in the urban centers, Cleveland, Columbus, Youngstown, the big urban areas that, uh, that are based on the federal classifications. When people talk about class, white males in Appalachia were graduating from high school at a higher rate than the kids in the urban centers. And what we discovered in that evaluation was quite profound. Because it wasn't, we knew, we, of course, we analyzed the secondary data. We also did site visits and observed and collected data on the sites. And what we discovered in that evaluation, when kids get suspended from school, is usually the same teachers who suspend the same, who write the same students up. And so what schools are not learning, when kids are not in the classroom, they're losing important learning because academic achievement is highly correlated with the relationship the student has with the teacher 
as well as the number of contact hours with the teacher. So this principal decided in this one school, because I guess it happened enough, he decided rather than when the kids needed to go in school suspension, rather than putting the students in, in school suspension for all the classes, he did it for that one class, but he made that one teacher go through professional development, right? There's just something, that's a, that's a nugget to think about. It's family culture issues, poverty and economic stress. And so I don't want to just pick on people who come from fragile, vulnerable communities, but increasingly you, we have educated families who are increasingly not spending quality time with their kids. Increasingly we have two professionals working and the kids are not getting the same kind of stimulation as you would say, see with some of our urban and rural spaces. So stress and poverty sometimes leave debilitating effects on our young people in ways that we haven't been able to recognize. So these are some of the social community factors Increasingly, this is one of the things that I'm learning when even when students matriculate in college, particularly the males, is not having the ability to regulate emotions. And increasingly, just even being at AERA and the counseling in me, when people talk about imposter syndrome and some of those kinds of things, you can sense a deep level of pain when you're being neglected and rejected in some form. And um, how do we help people cope? How do we help when you come from communities where you've had traumatic experiences? Uh, I can speak for that pretty clearly, particularly with some of our programs we have at Ohio State, how sometimes students self-destruct because of the trauma they experience. So individual factors, problems with unstructured time. We, how many here know that, ha, has anybody ever evaluated the differences in young men's notes versus young women notes? Has anybody, one thing is, did the men actually even take notes? And what the notes even look like when they, these are things that you can see and not only that, when I say pipeline issues, I, I like to use this as an antidote to make people laugh, laugh. My discipline is predominantly women. When the women want my doctoral students come and meet me, they're, they're going to say, pull out their laptop. They're going to ask me, can they tape record me on their phone? And when they get home, guess what they're going to do? They're going to send me dictated notes to make sure when my men come in they might look good they might be dressed better than me smelling good nice briefcase everything no paper not writing anything down they get home and this is these are real examples Dr. Moore who is that person you said I need to contact now I laugh if you don't believe me see some of these Go to a PTA meeting and watch the dads. I can't get the research out of me because when I go to PTA, my wife said, what are you doing? One of your studies in your head. The, the moms have got the notes. They get the papers, whatever's handed out. And what is so profound about this, IQ is highly correlated with mother's educational attainment and father's income. Moms still do most of the nurturance in the household. More research needs to be done when people say, well, the person came from a single parent household. What is the role that dad should be playing in the household? Because increasingly, I'm seeing an uptick of young men who are incarcerated who, da who the dad lives in the home. Because I had a doc student just finish her dissertation and we noticed that the two-parent households had just as many people who were incarcerated than the single-parent household. 
So I'm not gonna. I gotta get to something that I, my baby. Why I won't leave Ohio State? Why is personal? So Ohio State in the early 2000s, like many places and around, it was a consciousness going on in America. You know, the Journal of Men's Studies started. You know, I think uh, Dr. Davis, you all wrote those papers in 1999. You did a book, I think, in 2003. Uh, it was a, people were beginning to recognize there more work needs to be done around men broadly in particularly males of color. At Ohio State in 19, before 1987, we were an open admissions institution. In many ways, our Big Ten friends used to laugh at us. There were only two open admissions institutions in the Big Ten, and they were always two of the largest schools in the nation, Minnesota and Ohio State. I like to think, some may disagree, we're probably more alike than any other place. Urban, land grant, flagship, and this attention between the two. So my former predecessor who had this job, a Morehouse man, worked at Ohio State um, for 42 years, wanted to do something about it. So the thought leaders came together, and I was one of the, the on the research team, and we began to recognize we need to do something. Todd Anthony Bell was, if you remember when Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl, um, and uh, I think that was in 85, Todd was on holdout. And so some people like to say, believe, if he weren't holding out for more money, they probably would have went undefeated. In 1979, he was a guy who blocked a punt against Michigan that took us to the Rose Bowl. He was all American. I knew you would appreciate that. And when he retired from football, he wanted to come back, and he worked in the office. But he didn't know his family history. He was in good shape. He was leaving the gym. He had a heart attack and died. At Ohio State, we don't name anything after of you unless you write a check. And so because of the vice provost at that time said, we'll raise the money, I'm still raising money uh, for it. But we have some endowments that we and so at that time, Dr. Stewart said, well, we can and we will have greater impact in the lives of black males. Ohio State wants to be the world's land grant university and solve complex problems. And he felt that this was one of the grand challenges in America with this group. So he asked me to kind of develop it, a mission and those kinds of things. And so our desire, because you look at NIH, they fund centers that focus on women and their health. And we wonder why we have no centers that focus on men's health. So the center, these are some of our priorities, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I know time is of the essence. But what I want you to know, it started out as a black male initiative. And we started to make change and outcomes and so I have a national mission but I got a local budget so I make it look like I got a lot of money but it doesn't really take a lot of money and when I show you the data I would argue it's very few institutions in America have achieved this level of success and I don't count the ones who just bring five African-American males to their school so these are some of the things that we focus on at the center. And we want to create a community of scholars. So we stay pretty busy, but we try to study what works with our young men that could be scaled and that could be replicated at other institutions. So what we've learned in our research, these are important attributes for scholastic achievement. Realistic aspirations. Now what people don't know, if you look at the social science research, African American students brought, African Americans in general, have higher aspirations than all other groups. And most people look at me and say, wow, you look at the aspirations are off the chart. But that doesn't mean you go to class. 
That doesn't mean you do your homework. The aspiration. So it's what the term I use is the knowing doing gap. I say one thing, I do something totally opposite. What we learn in our work, if we can reduce the gap in what you say and, and, and align it with what you do, we get better outcomes. So positive belief in self, academic and career maturity, academic and social confidence, positive early school experiences, strong soft skills, self-regulated and task-oriented, and high expectations. But all the students don't come in with all of that, right? And people say to us, well, you get a better student. So I now our average ACT at the university is about a 29.2. But that's not the average for African-American students. When you look at the numbers, it's, it's quite drastically different. But it's higher than most large publics. So I want to show you the data. Well, before I do this, we say... Confidence plus confidence equals achievement attainment. Confidence doesn't produce competence, but competence produces confidence. So everything we I say when I work with school districts or I work with universities, you first got to focus on achievement. Because when you go back, I'll go back a little bit, Bandura, arguably the most influential social behavioral scientist in America, most people use his work in some form or fashion, or at least the constructs. It's four constructs of efficacy, but most people don't talk about it. They always talk about efficacy. All of them increase efficacy, but we tend to focus on the ones that increase efficacy the lowest, lower than the other. The highest level of efficacy is achievement. Most people, when they talk about you go to the K-12 schools, they got young men wearing neckties, they look good. But one of the things that I tell people, if they don't have the skills, I don't care how well you dress them, their confidence will fade away. Confidence produces confidence. And I think Dr. Davis understands that being a Morehouse man. Right? Social persuasion. I try to tell dads off the time, dads, I'm just going to go out there and talk to that boy. You might increase efficacy so to some degree, but it never increases efficacy like achievement. And then the other one is physio physiological factors. You know, you heard the speech or you went to church or you heard Obama and everybody thought, that everybody at AER, I think a few people did studies on the Obama effects and they realized they had, they had no impact. Not to hurt Obama's feelings. So national visibility, we've had over 50 different universities who have come and visited us and contacted us. Some have been on our campus three or four times because they're looking for Superman or the magic wand. So I'm going to show you some data. These are some of the many institutions who have contacted us and visited us. But we stole everything from HBCUs. The irony of it is... You come to Ohio State, and I got everything from HBCUs, as if they have nothing to offer. But the paradox of it is, I got everything from Morehouse, and now Morehouse called me. That's the paradox, right? So look at these numbers. I just want to show you. You can see our numbers. This is nothing to celebrate, but if you look at our large public Laying a large public flagship institutions, some places, I think Sean Harper in one of his reports said, we have some places less than 500 black males on a campus. Now, I know everybody like to think all of them are athletes. The reality at Ohio State, the black athletes, only 16%. But they play the sports that make the money for everybody else that make you think that all the athletes are black. But check this out. These are the retention rates for, to give you a highlight. The blue is the retention rates for the whole entire university that year. The red is the aggregate for all African American males. Usually we bring in about 150 a year. 
And that's nothing to celebrate. But it's a little bit better than most places. The EAP is what we call our early arrival program. And it doesn't focus on deficits. It doesn't focus on what you don't have. It's really recalibrating your mind. That's what I like to think. Is helping you to understand how you should approach your academics. And then to foster a healthy competition in academic success. It used to be two days. Then we went three days. Now we're back to two days. It used to have the highest retention rate, one of the highest on campus. And like I said, usually a third of the young men, anywhere between 50 and 60, participate in this program. And as you can see, in many cases, those who participate in the early arrival program did better. We focus on time on task. So I asked students, I, I had an NSF-funded project. I got my NSF colleagues in here. I, I had a question, and we had, it was a mixed method study, and I infused this into our work. We would ask, on a seven day, uh, out of seven days out the week, not counting homework, how many hours do you spend studying? When you take out homework, but these students were computer science, microbiology, engineering. The qualitative data said four hours. The quantitative data said five. We're talking about the best and brightest. So I would do an exercise when I meet with the students. How many here study at least? And to risk for me wasn't whether or not where you went to high school. Risk was for me was how much time you're going to spend on your task, particularly if you're in the STEM area. The STEM area, research says you should study two hours for every hour that you have. So if you have 14 hours, you should study 28 hours a week. We tell our STEM students, you need three hours for every hour that you're in school. And that's not counting homework. And they look at you and say, oh, no, I can't, I can't, can't do that. Right? But check this out. This is what I like to celebrate the most. Nearly 50% of our black males on our campus got a 3.0 cumulative GPA or higher. I would argue it's very few universities in the United States that you can count. When I first started in this quest, we had about 150. Now, this is the low expectation, as I guess President Bush would say, low bigotry. But the some of it, it doesn't. It comes from people who even look like them. They, I hate the term, and I do. When people say retention counsel, who wants to be retained? I don't want to be, I want to be let go. I want to be free. I want to be able to reach my dreams and my aspirations. How do you connect opportunities with individuals' aspirations? So what we did, we bought a wrestling belt. Anybody ever seen a wrestling belt before? And you think some of these guys can't walk and chew gum at the same time. But they want that wrestling belt. If you ever watch competition. Anybody ever seen young men play spades? It's pretty lively. <laughs> Anybody ever seen young men play video games? If you don't, come to my house and watch my son. And now you got these virtual opportunities, all his boys. And, and, and we, as parents, we say, well, they might as well come over our house because they're going to be up all night on the games. Right? It's a lot of energy and tenacity. So what we do, we put guys into pods, taking Tresman's work, Yuri, when he talked about calculus. And you can't put people in groups if you don't understand where they live in their dormitories. You can't have a, a group where the dorm, one, the dorm's on this side and somebody else on this side, because it get cold in Columbus, Ohio. They're not going to meet with each other. So to foster competition, we reward the group for the highest GPA. But not only that, we reward individuals who get the highest GPA uh, when they're a senior. We give two students a year a check for $2,500 who, based on scholarship, because to me, I don't want to do anything if you don't have, no, you don't, if you don't have scholastic achievement. 
The second thing is leadership, service, and, and, and ethics. We believe if you have those things and you build those capacities, you're going to have an individual who's going to be a sore. One year I had, I, this year I have a group of young men, all four, they came in together and they didn't live in the same area. They all got accepted in med school. They're trying to decide which one. I got to meet with them to decide, right? Now, places like Michigan call us just to specifically recruit our young men because they get in the top med schools, Cornell. I'm talking about the top. Now, my philosophy and what we try to do, we coach up. Teachers teach down sometimes, but I ain't never, I've never seen a coach coach down. Not, one, not any of my coaches, even when you were not as good as you. So how do you help people coach up and elevate? And so I'd like to give you a couple of nuggets about one guy in particular, and his name is Mark Reese. Mark Reese sent me a picture the other day, and he says he was in a Delta plane because now he's flying Delta for Delta and he lives in Brooklyn and what I learned about him and the others this is the first time in most of these young men's lives when they come on our campus when they see 63 guys some from urban spaces some from rural spaces some might have lived in South Africa I had some they, they were American but their parents were working there and they brought them in that's the first time in their life that they ever been in a room with someone who looked just like them that was equally as smart as they were. That's education meal practice. When you went through your educational journeys that you didn't even have a peer that you can pull from. The problem right now, what I would say, as you can see, these are the numbers. Um, let me go back here. These are the students who are full-time. We have about 500 and I think three who are full-time. But if you see when you go back, when you count full-time and part-time, we had 632 African-American males with a cumulative 3.0 or better. So helping African-American male students to achieve. Behave as if you expect them to achieve at a high level. Actively to work to remove barriers for their learning. So we, first of all, have to get them to reimagine and develop the appropriate academic behaviors that are indicative of excellence. And we call it the ethos of excellence. It's not a destination. It's a disposition. It's an attitude. It's the drive. Teach these students how to help themselves. Too often in schools, we do their work and they still are not afforded the opportunity to develop the skills that they need. Teach African American and their families how to successfully manage the bureaucracy of the system. So when, when they drop parents, we drop parents off, when the parents leave after the, when, they, when the parents drop their kids off for, at, at the, for the early arrival program, I have a special session for the families how to support your child for success from home. And if they want to come home, mom, in most cases it's mom, I'm not trying to be, you have to tell them they need to be there. And sometimes it's hard, so you have to coach the parents, especially families, when that child was a significant figure, and sometimes <laughs> the father figure of the household. And you help them to support them and you, you guide them. If you're a parent in here and you about ready to send your child to college, they need to learn life skills like learn how to wash their clothes. And you'd be surprised. I had to, and not only that, if you have a child that don't like to get up in the morning, that doesn't like to get up in the morning, 
you really need to help them develop the skills that prepare them for what the expectations are. You'd be surprised. One mom said, is there anybody in your office can wake up so-and-so every morning? And then I said, Miss so-and-so, you make sure you come to my session before you leave, right? Use school data to, when you're in school to promote system change. Sometimes we look at things, I had, my wife has learned, and now I hear her on the phone talking to her girlfriends, her Delta friends, is that, that's like, wow, I'm not getting paid for this, and you giving them free advice. Is that good schools don't mean, good schools don't mean they're good schools for your kids. And too often we look at the data and say, oh, they got these ACT scores, and I always joke with my wife, well, tell me what the young black males have. Tell me how many actually been in the program. Now, I must say, I have to say I was really impressed with my son. I thought he was going to cave in to his basketball friends. And he told us he wanted to be in Fairfax because of the politics. They don't have just, they don't call it gifted, they call it advanced academics. They got to have four tiers, right? one of the few school districts that do it because it's so political and families got money, but that's a whole other story. And my son said, no, Dad, I want to be the best. And he said, I said, well, what does that mean to be the best? He said, well, I want to go to the best school. And he said, didn't you say Moors do more? I said, yeah, that's what your mom, grandma said, Moors do more. And so, but the, the, but the fact of the matter is he has certain behaviors if we don't correct is going to contribute to his academic demise, right? And the signs are there when you do these tests. So many of us keep saying, well, I don't like tests. I love tests when they're used properly. A test should be a diagnostic where you can make improvements, but not as whether you have it or you don't have it. And we just don't use tests right in this country. Okay. I want to get to the college and I'm going to stop because I saw my sign. Create bridge or early arrival programs to help African American males smoothly transition into their first year of college. So transition, I, you know, many ways you study yourself through others. I went to college for free, but my parents probably spent $10,000 on telephone bills because I was so homesick. And my mom used to hang up on me when I said I wanted to transfer. Offer ongoing success coaching and support. And don't let students to say they don't, they don't like or that's not them because kids foreclose on options and opportunities when they've never been exposed to it. Provide resources and strategies that promote academic excellence. Develop students' personal, professional, and leadership skills which we do, and we offer a leadership institute, and it's always a waiting list, and we don't give credits for it because the students want to connect with the kind of people who we bring in contact with them. Initiate the mentoring pro process with current undergraduate students and faculty. Build solidarity among the males, and I'm finished. Thank you.